Well, last time I was disappointed by how not hard Hard Rock Zombies is. So it's time for us to take a look at the Metal Heaviness Hierarchy. Here at the top we've got Hard Rock, and the further down you go, the heavier the music gets. So yeah, here you got Hard Rock, which is technically not a form of metal, but there are a lot of Hard Rock bands that kind of blur the line. Maybe they count as metal, maybe they just count as Hard Rock. Uh, either way, they're up here at the top, as well as, you know, classical British heavy metal, uh, bands like Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, uh, maybe today are just considered Hard Rock, but in their time were the predecessor to heavy metal, the next big genre. This is sort of a catch-all term for, you know, your typical metal affairs, your, your Judas Priests, your Iron Maidens, heavy metal. And it has its own subgenres, hair metal, power metal, and of course, speed metal. The latter of which was a big inspiration for the next big drop down the metal heaviness hierarchy, thrash metal. Where Metallica, Megadeth, Anthrax, and Slayer still reign in blood. Of course, it's around here you have other harder subgenres like groove metal, uh, which is a weird name, but, you know, it's like Pantera, anything that sounds like Pantera. And there's tons of other little subgenres in here, like shitty-ass new metal. But where we want to go is down here, the bottom layer, the heaviest stuff, death metal and black metal. And their little subgenres like grindcore and screamo, but we won't worry about those right now. Now I know what you're thinking, Matt, what's the difference between death metal and black metal? And the answer is mostly complexity. Like, death metal tends to be a lot more harmonic and tends to have much longer, more lyrical lines than black metal, which is shorter, choppier, less in tune, more punkish. Like, here's death metal. And here's black metal. But this is not a one-two binary. It's sort of a spectrum from one to the other, with death metal on one side, black metal on the other, and a lot of stuff that falls in between. You'll even hear people say stuff like blackened death metal, but... At that point, you're being overly pedantic, and you kind of need to shut up. Kind of like me right now. Point being, if we want to hear some heavy music in a movie, we gotta go all the way down here. There were some movies. Terrible movies. Movies so awful, no one would touch. Then came a Matthew. Sad little Matthew. Matthew decided these movies to watch. For every good movie, there's at least ten bad. Matthew gonna drag himself through the crap to find the worst ones around to be had. Today's episode Death Metal Zombies. Happy Metalween, Internet! I'm called Matt, and today we're taking a dive into the deepest, darkest pockets of metal to look at Death Metal Zombies. Death Metal Zombies is a 1995 film written, directed by, and starring Todd Jason Cook, an indie horror director and apparently a professional skateboarder. He modeled some of the stunts for Tony Hawk Pro Skater 4. The film stars... Well, basically no one you're likely to have heard of. I mean, it was made for basically no money in Houston, Texas. Holy shit. I have friends in Houston. I could maybe find the neighborhood this was shot in. I'm not gonna, but I could. It also means filming was delayed thanks to the Houston floods of 94. Despite this, the soundtrack has... Well, not complete unknowns. I mean, it's hard to say any death metal band is particularly popular, but they got names you might have heard of if you care about death metal. Deceased, Incantation, as well as lesser known groups like Exit 13. It checks out. But the box fails to mention that this features music from Anal Cunt, who they've hilariously credited as AC. And unlike Hard Rock Zombies, which looks like shit because of how poorly preserved it was, 
This movie was shot on video, which means it always looked like shit. So let's take a listen to a little undeath metal with death metal zombies. Aw oh, yeah, play this movie loud. A Driller Killer reference right out the gate. And the movie opens on a guy in a Nixon mask murdering two people. Because zombies aren't enough, there had to be a murderer. So the Driller Killer reference tells me these people are familiar with obscure horror, but I have to wonder how obscure it gets, because this could be a reference to Horror House on Highway 5, another film where the killer wears a Richard Nixon mask, but it's just as likely they just happen to have some Nixon masks sitting around. We meet the hot co-eds doomed to be horror movie victims, and by hot co-eds I mean three random women the director knew. I got some in the fridge, let me go check it out. What? The, the fridge is right behind them. Also, this is the most 90s house I have ever seen. That killed her, I guess. And then there are zombies just outside. One of them has her tits out, which, like, I've never thought zombie tits are hot. I don't get why they're in so many movies, but for some reason, it's even weirder here. Don't worry, though. Todd was looking out for us and put some people tits after the opening credits. And as I suspected, the hardness promised by a movie's title is usually much less hard than the actual music in a movie. <laughs> So they're not playing death metal, but they are at least playing metal. And of course their drummer pays tribute to that most metal band, Kiss. Better than this guy in a Jason Goes to Hell t-shirt. And this girl's got a plaid shirt tied around her waist. The plaid was more a look of, like, the grunge scene, which granted was the big sound in the mid-90s, but, you know, if I want to add it to my big board of metal subgenres, I'd have to also add, like, punk rock and alternative rock just to, like, show the intersection between all these genres, and frankly, it's just not worth my time. Anyways, we meet Tony and Brad and get a taste of their acting abilities. Hey, did you hear about the new Living Forks contest on the radio? No! What, 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 what is it? The winner of the contest gets an all-new Living Corp tape with a brand new song that will exist nowhere else in the world, dude. Man, I have got to enter that contest. That's, like, very valuable to me, at least, man. I mean, you know Living Corp is, like, my all-time favorite. So Tony tells Brad about a contest to win a free copy of the new Living Corpse album with an exclusive song that won't be available anywhere else. Deadline is this month, so get your card in soon. What's the address? The address, once again. Angel, give me a pen. Wow, amazing that that was on at the exact moment he needed it. What was the contest for again? Let's get him! What? Oh god, this is one of those movies where I'm gonna have to figure out what's happening to even know what to criticize. Except the acting. It's really obvious these people are not comfortable on camera. They can't even make mailing a letter seem natural. And it's edited like a sketch I would do by myself. You saw Pungent Stench and we did it. <laughs> True. All right then. Well, I saw Splatter Grind in 1991. Eh, they're kind of tame. Not like Living Corpse, man. Also, I think they're just hanging out at a public park. Hey, I got an idea. Let's get Johnny and Kathy and go to the campfire tonight. Yeah, man. The campfire. That singular, always burning campfire just outside of town. Yeah, but I'll need a nap first. I'm tired. What is this dialogue? It's like they just needed to fill dead air. Although I guess that nap he wanted was just laying in his girlfriend's lap? Why not just have this scene take place in his bedroom so he can sleep in his bed? He has a dream about performing with Living Corpse, and death metal can be hard to listen to anyways, but the bad audio quality of this film does not help. <laughs> At 
And I can tell these two aren't actually together. They never kiss, just awkwardly hug. At the campfire, we meet Johnny, who's immediately my favorite character because of this. Oh no. <laughs> oh, and then you get Brad just awkwardly pointing like he's Spider-Man. And Johnny's girlfriend just saying what we already knew. Oh shit, here comes trouble. So a fight starts with Brad's friends and these guys, but... Uh, these guys obviously outnumber them. Should be easy for them, if anyone could fake fight worth a damn. Johnny gets stabbed, but still manages to beat these guys up. God, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. It's a small one. I'll be okay. You got stabbed, dude. Go to the hospital. Anyways, Brad wins the contest, and look how excited he is. Congratulations, Brad. Your tape's on its way. I won! I won! I can't, be I can't believe this, man. They're right. I actually had good luck for a change. And wait till you see his reaction to getting it. Yes! Yes! So the gang gets together to jam to the new album. Too bad Angel had to work tonight. She's not here to hear this. Yeah, Johnny had to work tonight too. You don't have to explain why characters aren't there. I'll just assume they're doing something else. And, well, it's shitty death metal, but it is at least death metal. And these guys are even bad at moshing. How can you be bad at moshing? It's the easiest thing to do. You just throw yourselves at each other. Play a Deathgasm clip or I'm gonna lose my shit. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. And you guessed it, the exclusive track turns them into zombies. You may notice this is remarkably similar to the plot of Trick or Treat. And to signify their becoming zombies, they play reversed footage of them blowing out smoke. Yeah man, let me light up. Uh, for my zombie movie, you know? Ooh. Rise! Wait, who the fuck are these assholes? I guess they're living corpse? They are the ones who wrote the song, but like, maybe show them in one scene other than blurry concert footage before this? Cut to Eddie, one of the punks from earlier, hanging out at the campfire, which I guess actually is an eternally burning campfire, when the Nixon killer emerges from the woods and kills him. How did we get the most intense metal music so far over the least intense death scenes? Then there's this scene of these guys and this one buff dude whose girlfriend left him. Yo man, why you gotta keep talking about her? She's history. She's out of your life. I just can't get her out of my mind. I, I, I can't believe she left me. It's not important. You know they're gonna die. No one introduced after the half-hour mark of a film can survive. Maybe we just should let him get it off his chest? I don't know. That's an awful big chest. That could take years. If I find out who it is, I'll kill him. Why weren't these guys the main characters? They're way better actors. Yeah, a uh, zombie Brad stabs him in the nuts, and he does this. Why would 
would a zombie stab someone? That's not how zombies work. But this lady has it coming. She just lets a woman carrying a knife walk right up to her. And I guess they're eating people after stabbing them? But Brad punched all the way through a dude. The knife is unnecessary. I guess Tony gives us some exposition. He mentions Shin Guard, who hadn't previously been mentioned, and this is about all the explanation we're gonna get. Shin Guard wants to play with you. Followers. Yet they never explain who or what Shin Guard is or what his plans are. The only way they elaborate is by telling us he's the lead singer of Living Corpse. Oh, and they, uh, skinned Johnny alive. Angel turns on the radio and whatever's playing hurts the zombies. Is... is that supposed to be pop music? Is that the bit? Is, is shitty pop music what defeats the zombies? But, uh, this guy shows up, says he's Shin Guard, and destroys the radio. <laughs> but metal keeps playing when he does. Is this diegetic? Is he making the music continue to play, or what? And apparently they're attracted to metal music because this chick's jamming out and it causes Tony to show up. And apparently he has mind powers to unlock doors? He could punch through it, but that probably would have cost production some money. And she just has a machete sitting around that he uses to kill her. <laughs> Friday the 13th Part 2 did it better. And they were stealing it from a bay of blood. Who also did it better than Friday the 13th Part 2? Why do they keep killing people? Didn't he say Shin Guard needed more followers? He doesn't even eat her, he just walks off. They get Angel surrounded and she still escapes. These zombies suck. Oh hey, Johnny didn't die. Then whose skeleton was that? It's on one of the posters, it seems important. Also, Angel straight up calls him the wrong name. Where's the tape, Tommy? So, I'm gonna cut in on myself here. The Amazon Prime subtitles have her saying Tony, and this character is not Tony. This is Tony. Um, but listening to it without subtitles, I'm pretty sure she actually says Tommy, not Tony. So maybe I just misheard Tommy as Johnny, but I'm starting to suspect... These are two different characters who just look very similar, and Tommy just comes out of nowhere. Like, nearly at the end of the film. There's like 20 minutes left in the film, and Tommy just shows up out of nowhere. And Johnny actually is dead. Could be wrong. She could have just called him the wrong name, or maybe I misheard Johnny as Tommy. But I'm pretty sure they're separate characters. Oh, and apparently the music she was playing earlier was supposed to be country? Play country music. Hmm, country. Yeehaw. They decide to play the music backwards to stop the zombies, but like... How do they know that'll stop them? Are they just guessing? Because to be fair, it's a pretty cliched movie. That'd probably be my first guess, but like... They jumped straight to this plan as if they weren't just guessing, but they couldn't possibly know that would work. In order to play it backwards, though, they're gonna have to record it and play it back. And the song is 13 fucking minutes. Oh, so it's progressive metal. Which means they gotta fight zombies. And the zombies who can punch all the way through people go down in one hit. This isn't working! This isn't working. You've killed three of them. Oh, I guess she meant let's casually walk into the other room. Fortunately, the play the music backwards plan worked, and they got a flaming skeleton in there, so color me impressed. And everyone goes back to normal. But here's where we get a split. The original ending had the Nixon killer murdering a lady, but the 10th anniversary edition changed it. We get a 10 years later title card, and then the Nixon killer uploads the exclusive track onto the internet. Still does not answer who he was or what he had to do with all of this. 
is this just the same killer from Horror House on Highway 5? There's no reason it couldn't be. He never takes off his mask or explains his intentions. Or, hear me out on this one, he's also Satan from Satan's Little Helper. And that's death metal zombies. It had death metal in it. This is clearly something some guy threw together with his friends, and it's hard to fault him on that. It seems like they had fun making it, at least. The production value is non-existent, and the plot's pretty predictable. But it's worth a few laughs, both intentional and unintentional. I wish I could see a more polished version of this, something that wasn't shot on zero dollars in a guy's house. But I can accept it for what it is. A fun, homemade attempt at a splatter flick with a metal edge to it. What else can you say about a movie like this? Uh, if you want to see something similar, but with a much higher budget, I reviewed Trick or Treat. And until next time, Happy Metal Ween. But for some reason, you weren't there. Well, it was just a dream. Yeah, I know, but you should have been in it. I don't need to be in your dreams, just your reality. At long last, after years of intense research, I finally know the true identity of the Nixon killer. David DeFalco. Wait, who the fuck is David DeFalco?